our second speaker is uh, Yun Chen Li, who just asked the last question. And the title of his presentation is The Optimus Use of Images. So Dr. Li, if you're ready. Uh, can I share the screen? So. Of course. Okay. Is my screen now being shared? Yes. Okay. So I, it's my, uh, for my laziness, I didn't have, uh, I didn't prepare for the presentation, uh, the forms, I mean, the, the material. So instead just, uh, let me use my paper so that you can follow, uh, when I read. And just uh, by reading the paper uh, prepared, uh, just uh, let me give my talk, okay. So it's called uh, the Otimas Use of Images. First, uh, the Otimas accounts for errors. In the symposium, the Otima tells Socrates about errors. To Socrates who ask whether errors uh, is ugly and bad and errors is mortal, the Otima teaches about correct belief that it is in between wisdom or prudence and ignorance because it is neither knowing as being unaccountable nor not knowing as hitting upon what is and then immediately compares errors to it to describe him as a middle being in between the beautiful and the ugly and between mortal and immortal, namely a spirit or spiritual being. The power of a spirit clarifies the ultimate continuously is interpreting and conveying things from human beings to gods, from, uh, to gods, uh, from human beings to gods and from gods to human beings by which they can communicate with each other. Then she presents an account for the origin of errors that on the day of birth of Aphrodite, Poros got drunk and fell asleep and Penia who plotted to have a child from Poros lay down beside him and got pregnant with Eros. Eros by such origin is clarified as a lover who loves constantly what he lacks, namely the beauty, especially wisdom because it is one of the most beautiful things. Again, to Socrates who still believes that Eros is of the beautiful things and asks what advantage Eros has for human beings if Eros is such a middle being. The Ultima asks what being of the beautiful, uh, what being of the beautiful things means as Socrates answers that it is becoming for oneself, she corrects it as being always for oneself, for the sake of happiness. With Socrates' full assent, the Ultima concludes that the work of Eros is of procreation and giving birth in the beautiful, namely of the immortality, because being always for oneself, i.e. being immortal, is possible only by such activities, both along body and along soul, and even with knowledge. However, Socrates, although he is amazed by her account, wonders whether these things about the work of Eros for immortality are truly thus, as Diotima has uh, described. Diotima changes her speech style from a dialogue form to a monologue form, about which Socrates expresses that she now speaks just like the perfect sophist. So Diotima, articulating, be well aware that any type of love in human beings is in fact to pursue the immortality presents some exemplary cases of loving honor, saying that do you Socrates think that Acestes would have died for Admetus or that Achilles would have died after Proclus or your Codros would have died in defense of the kingdom for his children if they had not thought that there would be an immortal memory about their excellence, which we even have now, far from it. All do all for the sake of immortal excellence and famous fame of this sort. And the better they are, the more it is. For they love the immortal. Diotima emphasizes in this regard that those who are pregnant in body pursue to procre procreate bodily children. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, while those who are pregnant in soul are eager to beget prudence and excellence, especially of the uh, management of domestic and public affairs, namely justice and moderation. One who is godlike and pregnant with this sort of prudence in one's soul from the childhood, continues the Ultima, looks for someone beautiful in whom one can procreate them, welcomes him, 
and attempting to educate him with many accounts, uh, procreates those sorts of prudence and excellence with him as their immortal offspring. Dietima justifies this with some examples that all would prefer children of this immortal sort rather than human children to be born to themselves. Looking up to Homer, Hesiod, and the other good uh, poets, and being that such offspring is left from them, who, as being themselves this immortal sort, provide their parents immortal glory and memory. So if you, Socrates, wish to look at another example, see such children like Krugus left behind in Sparta as the savior of Sparta in Greece. Solon too is honored by you for his procreation of the laws and the other men as well in other places everywhere among Greeks and among barbarians since they have shown many beautiful works and begotten all sorts of excellence. For them, many shrines have already been born because of their children of this immortal sort, but none yet because of their human, i.e. mortal children. Finally, the Otima moves on to the perfect and the mysterious things related to Eros, namely the ascent towards the beauty itself. To explain, to explain uh, how the ascent proceeds, uh, she states that for the sake of that beauty itself, beginning from these beautiful things in this world, one must go up, just like using ladders, from one to two, from two to all the beautiful bodies, and from the beautiful bodies to the beautiful customs, and from the beautiful customs to the beautiful learnings, and finalize going up from the learnings to that learning, which is the learning of nothing other than that beauty itself and thus finalizing, may recognize what is beautiful by itself. By her account, Socrates is now entirely persuaded on Eros. So why, in what sense, uh, does Socrates label Diotima's account in a monologue form as that of a perfect sophist? Diotima, in her account for the work of Eros, repeatedly emphasizes that a true lover of beautiful things should procreate many accounts and use them for education. These accounts, according to Diotima, are of prudence and excellence, especially of how a good man should be and take care of management of domestic and public affairs, justice and moderation, particularly if intending to correctly follow the ascent of Eros, argues Diotima, one should successively uh, procreate beautiful accounts in a body, in a beautiful body, and good accounts related to customs and laws to make young people better in their soul. And finally, many beautiful and magnificent accounts in relation to knowledge from which one can finally reach single knowledge of the beauty itself. Such, man, uh, such management is a topic common to the sophist. Protagoras, for example, professes to teach this topic to young people by accounts so that they possess civic excellences and become better citizens. Phaedrus, who is the most sophist-like among the participants in the banquet to praise Eros, also describes Eros to be the most authoritative on the acquisition of, human, uh, on the acquisition of excellence and happiness for human beings. That Diotima puts emphasis upon such a topic may explain why Socrates labels her, her new speech style as that of sophist. Maybe Eros will be called sophist uh, by Diotima in this regard. Yet, it does not clearly reveal why she is called a sophist who is perfect. In addition, the topic, albeit common to the sophist, is not the subject only for the sophist to deal with. It still needs to be discussed then who exactly the sophist who is the perfect is and what characteristics the account by the perfect sophist would have. Second, uh, sophist and image. Despite his uh, hostile and sarcastic and critical attitude towards, uh, towards the sophist at his time, Plato further attempts to clarify the nature of a sophist in the sophist. After several clarification, uh, clarifications by the division method, he finally suggests that the sophist, in brief, is likely to be one who practices within expertise as a whole, the art of making, the art of image making, the art of spoken image making, the art of operation making, the art of mimicry to produce operations, the art of belief-based mimicry, 
the art of insincere belief based mimicry, and finally, the art of insincere belief, uh, belief based mimicry with short accounts in private. In sum, sophi uh, the sophist is a practitioner of the art of operation making by means of putting contraries in accounts with the beliefs for the sake of disputation in private. Image, a dolon, is argues Plato, something made similar to a true thing, but different from the true thing, and shares the same name with the original. Image, which is hence contrary to a true thing itself, is divided into likeness, acorn, and apparition, phantasma. Likeness, which is likely to be the original, is an imitated image whose generation is made in accordance with the proportions of the original. Again, likeness is an image that can be made by imitating an eternal being by a good one among the causes and after that which is changeless and grasped by an account and prudence or wisdom. Therefore, while an account conveying the true in itself as the true is changeless, is unchangeable and unrefuted and ensures the truth. On the contrary, an account carrying likeness in it is in fact, uh, is actually like a uh, fake and imaginary, but bring convictions or correct beliefs to soul about which the uh, likeness imitates. On the contrary, apparition, which appears to be original, is an image that only beautifully appears to be the ori original, without its correct pro uh, proportions. Operation is again divided into an operation made through external tools and operation produced through the body of imitator himself. Among the imitators in the latter case, some imitate while knowing what they are imitating and some others do, uh, some others do while not knowing. The former performs the in informed mimicry with knowledge while the latter, the belief-based mimicry with the belief. Under the art of image making, thus the operation making is practiced either by one who knows the original or by one who does not, because its aim is to procreate an image that only appears seemingly beautiful from layman's perspectives. The likeness making on the contrary, it must be performed only by one who can carry in an image the pro pro uh, proportions correctly along, along the original, namely a knower of the original. Likeness and apparition, which are derived, which are both derived from image, are not exclusively paired under the item from which they come divided. It can be inferred that the likeness making lies under the spoken image making and from it, the informed mimicry is derived. From this again, the sincere informed mimicry comes and finally, the sincere informed mimicry with short accounts in private is fairly derived from this. A practitioner of the art of likeness who, while being informed and sincere, produces an image that bears the correct proportions of the original in accounts for the sake of disputation in private, is an image made through imitating the original, i.e. an imitator. The practitioner of this art should share his name with the original of this practitioner. The original of this practitioner is the same, as, is the same one as that of the, uh, that of the practitioner of the operation making, namely the wise, from whom the, his name also comes, i.e. sophist. The practitioner of the likeness making yet is more like the wise than practitioner of the operation making is because this practitioner, as one who knows, carries in him the correct proportions of the wise. This practitioner then must have a name after the original but distinguished from the name of the practitioner of the operation making, namely the sophist who is accomplished to be more correct or perfect. Plato emphasizes that not every soul lies in the same cognitive state at the same time. Some, if its nature fits, can reach the truth by direct uh, accounts that describe it. But some other needs another type of accounts as an aid appropriate to it. 
when aiming to be successful in persuading uh, via accounts, does argues Plato, one should be able to compose accounts with precision in every aspect to know by what soul by nature acts and is acted upon and to classify the kind of accounts and soul and the affected states of soul, to go through all the causes, to coordinate each soul with each account appropriate to it, and even to teach through what cause, what sort of soul would be necessarily persuaded and or not persuaded, but what sort of accounts. Then indirect accounts, for it does not directly describe the truth of the original, should have something else in it, which is distinguished from the original, but still carries its correct proportions, namely likeness as image. Yet an account with likeness is still a lie due to its characteristics to be apart from the original. Nonetheless, such a lie is not only useful, but also necessary, especially for producing benefit in soul and thus in a city for it guides the soul which is appropriate to it into a correct path of this. So one who has already seen the truth about beautiful and just, beautiful, just and good things, recognize each image for what it is and also that of which it is the image, Argus Plato. One who knows the truth, hence in, in, uh, needs to invent good and fine myth as these sort of useful lies and use it upon those who do not know so that they can have not knowledge though, but at least conviction or cor correct belief by which they are correctly guided into good and fine deeds. Plato calls such a lie noble, not merely because it advantages people, but also most probably because it happens to hit upon the truth, sharing noble lineage with the original. Third part. Image, images in Diotima's accounts. Let's go back to the Diotima's case. Diotima, who is pictured to be characteristic of knowing errors with her sincerity of her knowledge and generosity to share it with Socrates, aims to persuade him about errors. For this aim, she tests Ellen Cross, uh, Socrates and sees his soul stay in a dichotomist belief that one has to be either this or that exclusively. And in a limited belief that one gains advantage only from anything good, beautiful, and wise. To correct his belief, Diotima, in a form of what X is, namely a descriptive structure, presents Socrates some accounts that directly describe the truth of correct belief and errors, so that correct belief is a middle being between prudence, Sophia, and ignorance, which means what the correct belief is. And the Eros is a spirit who is a middle being between beautiful good and ugly bad, and between immortal and immortal and mortal, which means who Eros is. Her following accounts for the origin and work of Eros contain some happenings on the day of the birth of Aphrodite and stresses, stress pregnancy and procreation to be a divine matter with reference to the names of three goddesses of birth. Still, these are not presented as examples of allegories, uh, examples or allegories, but as factors to define eros. Namely, eros is one who is born full of methods and deficient in resources, who eros is. And the work of eros is the work of procreation, giving birth in the beautiful, namely of the immortality. Uh, what, the, uh, what the work of eros is. When changing her speech style due to Socrates' doubt or inability, or inability to understand the Diotima, in another form of what X is like, namely an explanative structure, composes her accounts with the use of examples to explain. She puts some mythical cases of Alcestis, uh, Achilles, and Codrus into her accounts to show that they pursue immortality in case of loving honor. The first two cases are the examples adopted by Phaedrus, who emphasizes that Eros is great, oldest, and the most honored God with the most authority on human acquisition of excellence and happiness, as we saw before. When he argues how beautiful it is that Eros inspires them to strive after their beloved. Diotima uses the same mythical characters to explain that Eros is of the immortality. Alcestis and Achilles, 
by dying for Admetus and after Proculus, Percy, they are honored to be remembered forever. Codrus, a mythical king of an early Athens, who is usually taken as an ideal model of patriotism and self-sacrifice uh, because of his sacrifice, according to myths, to save his kingdom from the Dorian invasion, is taken in Diotima's accounts as an another example of pursuing immortality, that he sacrifices himself for the sake of immortal memory of his excellent deed. So his sacrifice is a method for this, this immortality. These examples from myth, although they are not direct descriptions of the work of Eros, by imitating it, provide an idea how uh, about what the work is like. The examples are hence the images of the work of Eros. Phaedrus probably focuses on the, some seemingly beautiful aspect of Eros as he insists how beautiful it is for one to die for or after one's beloved namely apparition of the work of Eros as what the work of Eros appears beautifully. On the contrary, Diotima intends not to claim how beautiful Eros is, but to explain how correctly Eros works. She, by means of presenting the examples that are correctly imitating the works of Eros, namely its likeness that carries the correct proportions of the work, shows what the work of Eros is, uh, is correctly likely to be. The images of Homer, Hesiod, Lycurgus, and Solon from the mythical and historical examples also show what the work of Eros is likely to be, yet more specifically in relation to love of immortality. These images to show that they are worshipped and vividly living in undying memories, not because they are themselves immortal, but because what they have procreated are living always in people's mind. And these images suggest a picture in which the pursuit of immortality of human beings is correctly imitated. In this regard, Diotima's accounts are in the explanative structure with likeness from the, the work of Eros is likely to be the work of Alcestis, Achilles, Codrus, Homer, Hesiod, Lycurgus, and Solon. So that, so it explains, so that it is of immortality by procreation procreating and giving birth in the beautiful. And what, uh, what, which means what the work of Eros is likely to be. The analogy of letters too, although it is not the ascent of Eros itself, cast a view to see how the ascent is likely to proceed. Just like going up through every step one by one using letters, the ascent of Eros proceeds via every stage one by one without skipping any stage. Diotima's account with the image of letters is structured as the ascent of Eros is likely to be going up using letters so that one should take every stage to go up until one reaches the beauty itself, which means what the ascent of Eros is likely to be. So, Diotima's use of image is understood as her strategy to compose her accounts appropriate to Socrates' soul for the persuasive purpose. In her private lesson, when she finds Socrates to be doubtful of or unable to follow her accounts, her direct accounts for the truth of errors, Diotima, with emphasis on making and using accounts for the sake of education about the management of domestic and public affairs, fills her accounts with the likeness of Eros that carries the correct propor proportions of his work. So thanks to such accounts, Socrates gets his initial beliefs removed from his soul and understands Eros, claiming that he knows at least the things related to Eros, especially to his work, and that he further attempts to persuade others about it, since he has been entirely persuaded. I think here, Diotima is found as one who speaks just as a sophist who is perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk, Dr. Lee. So, okay, so we have uh, yep, another q and session now. So please raise your hand uh, if you have any question.
I'm very much honored that there is no question. Uh, you can uh, click to the the region the, uh, button, or you can just shout onto the micro through the microphone to at me. Then I can. Okay. Ah, uh, Dr. Leonard, you yeah, please please ask the question. Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, I just want to ask, uh, I mean, two or three questions. Uh, the first question is about the art of image making uh, from the sophist. Uh, yeah. We just said that uh, in the symposium, I, uh, the, the thing that uh, the philosopher or maybe even by the identification Socrates is a uh, sophist, uh, is a sophist, is from uh, his father, right? If I remember, from Poros. From Poros. And uh, so I would like to know uh, uh, if you would say that uh, the image, uh, the art of image making, so with this ambiguity of Eidolon, uh, distinguish then between the philosopher and the sophist uh, as the distinction that you mentioned about uh, phantasma and acon. That would be my, my first uh, question about the art of image making and what does it really mean that Diotima is a sophist and is this a kind of link with the fact that Eros is said to be a sophist from his father Poros, if I rem remember well? And the second question is, you mentioned the, the examples um, uh, that D Diotima uh, took from Phaedrus, uh, Alceste, Al 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 Achilles, but yeah. the third is Quadros. And uh, uh, Phaedrus, the third example was Orpheus. And actually, Phaedrus criticized very much Orpheus for being an effeminated. And what, how do you interpret the substitution of the third example? Uh, does it make a kind of connection between Phaedrus and Diotima, a, cri a, a kind of critic connection? And why Diotima is replacing uh, Orpheus, which was criticized by Phaedrus, by Quadrius, which takes care of uh, his children? Is this something to do with the poiesis and with the fact that Eros is procreative or also in the beauty for Diotima? Uh, that would be my two questions. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thanks for the questions. And it seems like just you and I are filling uh, this session. So uh, for the first question, I mean, I think it's kind of a striking passage from the Sophies that uh, Plato tries to make a distinction between a cone and phantasma under the umbrella term image, a dolon. So these are both derived from image. So which means they are anyway images, but they have different features, characteristic. And then, as you know, the interesting part is that in clarifying what the nature of sophist is, uh, Plato does not really discuss the case of image make, uh, the, the likeness making, he goes on to, he, he, he moves to the operation making to define the, what the sophist is. And another interesting part is that at the very end, uh, if you uh, give kind of like a clear uh, notice to the passive text, uh, Plato says that it is likely if you say the, the true sophist uh, is blah, 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 like this. So, at the very end, he says that the sophist is like this, but it is very much likely. If you say that, then it's very much likely to the truth to say the sophist is like this. So I think uh, it's kind of play for Plato to use uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, the differences of the terminologies, uh, acon and phantasma. So one thing we need to uh, note that there is a possibility of likeness making under image, uh, image making. The second one is still with the characteristic of image to be likely to be, the final definition of sophist is suggested in this way with the image, acon, uh, the likeness. So which means, uh, which enables us to infer the, uh, the another possible uh, possibility of the uh, clarification of the sophist, which who use still image, but not phantasma, but uh, likeness, like this. 
And another difference between uh, Phantasma and uh, Lycanid is that Phantasma, the Plato says that can be practiced, uh, operation making is practiced either by a knower or non-knower. But it doesn't matter whether the composer knows or not because its aim is to make things, images look beautiful. But uh, the likeness making, because it has to be uh, in accordance with the correct proportions of the original. If you don't know the original, you cannot put the correct proportions of it. So that's another interesting feature of a sophist who uses uh, likeness as image, who is also distinguished from the sophist who uses phantasma as an image. So I, I, I saw that uh, difference, from, uh, difference of the two types of sophist in the sophist, and then another interesting point is that uh, Diotima, who teaches Socrates, is called sophist, but not just sophist, but a perfect sophist. So maybe this perfect sophist would be the one that can be inferred from this possible clarification of a sophist who uses likeness as an image, to produce an image. And then this is, of course, to persuade people through logos. So uh, to your first question, this is uh, what, I was tr uh, what I'm trying to say. And then second question, uh, uh, I, th I think your question, the second question was about the Fedoros uh, and Diotima, why they use the same meat? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, why uh, the, uh, Diotima seems to substitute the third example, uh, which, were, which was our fears, uh, and which was criticized by uh, Phaedrus as an effeminate, and uh, Tima uh, substitutes to him Codrus, which uh, I th uh, help, uh, like save uh, his children. So why why this substitution? How do you interpret it? Ah, so why there is another example? So simply speaking, why is another example like, of, of Codrus? Why not enough only with like uh, Asestes and Achilles? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it's kind of obvious that Diotima adopt, adopts uh, the, the cases of Alcestis and Achilles to, to, to explain, and in a different way uh, from uh, the Phaedrus, uh, like a method to explain, then why there is another example. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't really think about it, but maybe it's because to, to give more like uh, more examples, so, but the point is, even the case of Codrus is used in the same, uh, in the same way as uh, the Isestis and then Achilles in Diotima's account. It's not a different model of the pursuit of Philotimia to be immortal, but it's still the same. So maybe the Diotima's point would be that uh, even one who dies, not only for his beloved, but for his country or kingdom, is still uh, should be understood in the same way as pursuing uh, the immortality in relation to philotimia. So usually, when say when people say uh, they uh, they die for love or after, after they, they die for love after or for they are beloved, uh, you can that's also what Phaedrus uh, adopts to emphasize how beautiful Eros is. Uh, that's not the only cases of loving, but also one can die for the country. So it's kind of another example, but still it explains the same, uh, same idea about the pursuit of immortality in relation to Philotimia. Maybe that's why uh, Diotima adds uh, as, a, as an, another example. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. I didn't really think about why Diotima adds the extra third case. Yeah. <laughs> 